This is Share the Vision, presented by the Resource Center, a discussion of the programs and services of the Resource Center and about issues related to individuals with disabilities. Today on this program, we preview the 7th Annual TRC Educational Symposium. You'll hear about the date, the time. It's coming very soon in just a few minutes. But first, let me introduce my guests on Share the Vision today. Michelle Albaugh, Director of Learning and Development here at the Resource Center. Heather Brown, Assistant Executive Director at TRC. And also in the room with us, Vicki Bardo, the Development and Events Manager from Filling the Gap. Steve Watterson, who's almost always here at the beginning of these shows, uh, was called to do something else. At least as we start the show today, he may be here as it comes to an end. We'll see. But first, so you can get to know the voices of the people on the air here today, Michelle, hello. Thanks for joining me on the radio. Good morning, Dennis. Nice to see you. Very nice to have you here. And Heather Brown, welcome back to Share the Vision. Hi, Dennis. How are you today? Well, fine. Let's talk a little bit about, since this is the seventh annual symposium, you have some history with doing these at the Resource Center. Tell me, uh, Michelle or Heather, what they're all about. The symposium is an opportunity for us to bring together thought leaders in areas that affect agencies like the Resource Center to learn and to also share some practices that maybe are working other places that we can take. It's not open just to our employees. It's something that we want to share with the community, other providers. That's been our focus in the past. This year, we are joining our previous educational conference and kind of merging the two. And so it's going to have some global perspective as well as some more targeted applications for people that are working in the field. Since you've talked about it and invited people from the community already, let's get the date, time, place out there for people. So if something in the next few minutes interests them, they would know where to go to get further information and perhaps sign up. It's being held on the grounds of Chautauqua Institute at Bellinger Hall on Thursday, May 12th. And we'll start at 9 a.m., and it goes to about 4 in the afternoon. If somebody's interested in registering, the easiest way is to go to our website, the Resource Center, trc.org, and there should be a link. It comes right up on the home screen. You click on it, and it's a very easy registration process. We're, ab- we're able to provide some scholarships through the funding from the Developmental Disability Planning Council. So individuals that receive supports and services or their family members can click on the scholarship button to register as well. Otherwise, the cost for people to attend this is how much? $99. And they can take care of all of that through the registration process? Absolutely. Now, you have already hinted at something that I really want to draw out over the next few minutes in terms of inviting people from the community, aside from those in the immediate sphere of the resource center, to attend this. And Michelle, you used the phrase global perspective. You have a very interesting, may I say, compelling list of speakers and presenters. So I want to allow you a little time as we get started on Share the Vision today just to name some names and give some background on this very interesting group of people. Our keynote speaker this year is Hans Meisner. He is the executive director of the Arc of Rensselaer. He has written a book called Creating Blue Space, The Intentional Act of Individualizing Supports. He also is going to do a breakout session for us on shifting roles and relationships and moving out of delegation into partnership. I've heard Han speak many times. He's very, very compelling. He's a leader of a learning institute, a statewide organization that gets people with disabilities together to learn about person-centered planning. I happen to have his book in my hand, and it's very, very interesting. It really talks about how individuals with disabilities can become full members of their community, can become citizens, have all of the rights and responsibilities that all of us do at this table and all of the listeners in that partnership. What does he mean by blue space? Blue space. It's the it's the space when you think about your community and all of the things that fill your life. One of the first questions is what do you do for a living when you meet somebody new? Very honestly, that's oftentimes the kickoff to a conversation. Individuals oftentimes with developmental disabilities don't have all of the things in their blue space that maybe you or I are so fortunate to have. If you walk up to an individual and say, what do you do for a living? What's your kind of purpose in life? What's your meaning? Everybody in this kind of theory is an equal citizen and has full opportunity to live life to the fullest and participate in everything equally. 
both Michelle and Heather, I don't want to stop you for too long because there are many other presenters, but it occurs to me just from doing this radio show that he is going to hit on some of the current trends, the hot issues in the world of helping people with disabilities today. You're both shaking your heads up and down. What resonates with you when I say that, Michelle? I think we're right at the cusp of really helping individuals have that full life, and we've been really moving forward as a as an organization as well as our sister organizations. And so I think the things that he's going to talk about are just going to cement our own thinking and give us some new perspective and kind of helping to move it forward. Heather, anything to add? No, I just think it's going to be a great kickoff that day. We're looking forward to it. I just want to say that uh, as the Chief Executive Officer of the ARC of Rensselaer County, uh, that's an organization very similar to the Resource Center operating in another county in New York State, eastern New York, near the New York State Correct. Capitol. Okay, so mm-hmm. that uh, ARC and, and the Resource Center sort of are in the same business, different names, but the same kind of organization. All exactly. Right. Let's go on because that's just one of many presenters. Who else is coming to the symposium on the 12th at Chautauqua that we should point out to our listeners? We're going to have a representative from NYSACRA. NYSACRA is a statewide trade organization that supports agencies like ourselves and others in Mm -hmm. coming forward with a common mission, doing advocacy, making sure that educational opportunities are always on the the cutting edge. And her name is Carol Nepresky. And she's going to talk about person-centered thinking in ways that individuals with disabilities can leverage technology in their daily lives to make them more independent and to be able to live on their own. There's a lot of apps nowadays, and there's a lot of smart home technology that people oftentimes don't think of. And they think that somebody perhaps with extensive medical needs or with certain disabilities need you know, 24-7 care. And that's becoming less and less the norm. So I think Carol's going to challenge our thinking in talking about what's going on across the state and across other areas, again, with person-centeredness, technology, and housing options. Um, Housing isn't always an easy barrier to overcome. Something interesting you said there, and let me take apart the acronym, see if I do it right. New York State Association of Community and Residential Associations. Absolutely. Good job. So uh, I just saw something as you were speaking, Heather, and that is persons with perhaps more limitations than some others might have in terms of their ability to move in uh, a residential environment, suddenly all of this exploding technology around us can turn out to be very supportive for them and perhaps give them a level of independence that that neither they nor the community could ever have conceived of before. You're both smiling at me it, It's very exciting, and we do some of it. We have a, a project that I think we've talked about before, the BIP program, and they are also working with a lot of technology individuals perhaps that can't get up to answer their front door and have in the past you know, left a front door unlocked so an aide could come in. Well, that's very dangerous in this day and age. There's technology that's very simple and very inexpensive. People can manage the locks, the lights, the heat from their phone with apps and downloads so we often don't engage in that we think oh a person must need help they've got to have somebody there at the house so very exciting cutting edge technology out there carol napierski who else is coming speakers presenters for this year's event We have a strong view on self-advocacy or perspective on self-advocacy with having people come from SANI's Self-Advocacy of New York State. We have Sophia Roberts and Mike Rogers who are going to speak about supporting people to speak up. And we also have Steve Holmes from SANI's who's going to do a presentation called Ha Ha and Soul, the Art of Moomba. And he's going to be talking about what purposes and how we can bring more hope and joy into our lives as we're supporting people with disabilities. He has a lot of stories that he likes to tell. In addition, we have Barbara DeLong, who's going to be talking specifically to parents. She is a parent herself and has been very active in advocating for things for her daughter and is going to be talking about current and future concerns regarding supports and services. And she is going to be a great resource as far as how things have happened, how she's been able to do things for parents. Let me take apart a couple of things, uh, extract a few things from what you just said, Michelle. And one is to help the listeners and me understand self-advocacy, because this may be an idea that those people who uh, don't regularly work in the environment of the place of a place like the Resource Center might not be familiar with. What is self-advocacy all about? 
It's about empowerment, people having controls over their own lives and what they want and what they need, and helping others to learn and listen to them as they're sharing their life goals for us. A lot of times in the past, um, people have relied on support providers to do that for them. And advocacy is telling the government, telling your service providers, telling your family the things that you need and want out of your life and learning how to do that. So really self-advocacy is something that would be applicable to anybody. I mean, we all need to learn some self-advocacy skills. Absolutely. But for someone who may have some physical or intellectual disabilities, it may be harder to advocate on behalf of themselves because they are either they are used to being provided for or we as a community are used to having them need to be provided for so we presume a level of need that may not absolutely be there yes and a lot of our systems have kind of over the years been developed so that we didn't provide that opportunity for people to even start to talk about what they wanted we just did it so it's really an evolution and a cultural change within the field And there's a whole association across New York State that uh, helps people with this kind of self-advocacy. Yes, and we we also uh, here at the Resource Center have some groups of people that are working towards that and and really taking some control over their own lives. Well, we got to go back to Stephen Holmes here for a second. Give the title of his program one more time. Ha Ha and Soul, and Art of Moomba. He has some songs and some stories that he wants to talk about in regards to self-advocate. He is a self-advocate himself. And so we're really excited to hear. Considering what you've said about self-advocacy, I'm very interested in knowing how he merges music and entertainment and that kind of inspiration together. It's got to be a very provocative presentation. Yeah, we're very excited about it. So you have three people who are speaking in that general area about different aspects of self-advocacy. Yes, we also have our own panel that maybe Heather could speak to a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We wanted to build on that and have some people come in from other areas of state. But also, we've done such rich things here in the last four to five years regarding self-advocacy, increasing independence, that we put together a panel. And this is going to be facilitated by Terry Johnson and Beth Germain, two folks that work here at TRC. But they're bringing together individuals that have moved out onto their own and have been living independently. One gentleman, Daryl, had lived in a group home for 27 years and was not satisfied and really wanted to live on his own and made that move when he was, I think, in his early 60s and has now been living on his own for several years, very successfully, very independently with some natural supports. Another gentleman that has obtained employment at Home Depot, which has always been a very, very strong advocate of persons with disabilities. And he and his aunt are going to come and talk about that journey because it wasn't easy. And there was some pitfalls and there were some back steps, but not giving up. Bruce, another gentleman who'd lived in one of our group homes for many, many, many years, living on his own, developing his whole new life. I love running into him and hearing about what he's up to these days. It's always interesting and engaging. Another family, Tim and Devin Roche, they live in the Silver Creek area, and they're just kind of beginning their journey in self-direction. Devin's a young man kind of finding his way, and Tim serves on one of our board advisory committees, and they're looking forward to coming to the panel. Nick Kilpatrick, if you've been at any of our other events, you'll often see Nick playing uh, musical instruments and guitar and building his own instruments. He's going to speak with his uh, support, Lisa Bongiorno, and their journey. Nick has, again, lived with Lisa in a a shared living situation for years now, very successfully. And Frank Guyot, another very, very interesting, engaging young man that has had a lot of ups and downs in his life and now being very successful in an alternate. So that panel, in an hour's time, is going to present kind of each of their personal stories. Beth and Terry are going to facilitate. It will be their stories, their voice, hearing from the family perspective. Uh, We're extremely excited. And that panel, we're going to actually present that at two different sessions, a morning and an afternoon session, because we believe that's going to be really popular. There are other speakers. Some things are emerging in the course of this conversation today that I want to get back to, but I, I want to stay 
on the program about the program for a moment. Are there any other speakers, uh, presenters that uh, we should identify? Heather, it looks like you want yeah, to say something. Just a few. One of the other sessions will be done by Jennifer Beagles and Wes McPhee. They are the Director of Transition Services at an organization that works with individuals who have disabilities who are transitioning to their college, careers, and life. It's a very specialized program. Wes is the executive functioning coach at Transitions. They're going to demonstrate their unique approach to involving the classes for active skill building, independence, social skills, and self-advocacy, and how they've combined it with peer mentoring into real-life environments in a college campus setting. It's being done in several areas in New York State, And we're just really anxious because we think that that would be a great opportunity to bring back to this community. So we'll be listening closely to their presentation. It it might seem a contradiction in terms, uh, at least at the surface, to talk about individuals with disabilities uh, going to college. But you make it sound like this is something that happens and that is being the, the pathway is being smoothed out for them. The transition is being enhanced for them as they embrace this. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's happening more and more, and partnerships are forming with agencies like ours and local community colleges to be able to structure the support system so people can be successful. And, again, kind of filling that space and going on to advanced education, just like everybody has the opportunity to do so. Let me, again, hone in on who can come or who might benefit from coming to your symposium. And again, we are here at the Resource Center talking on Share the Vision about the seventh annual educational symposium that the Resource Center is holding on Thursday, May 12th at Chautauqua Institution. Would this be appropriate environment for individuals with disabilities to come to also, Heather? Yes, most definitely. I think the lineup is really structured that there's something for everybody. There's individuals with disabilities, whether that be physical disabilities, developmental disabilities, mental health, behavioral health challenges, family members, most definitely. Michelle did mention Barb DeLong, who will be speaking. She's the head of the DONI, the Developmental Disabilities Association of Western New York, strong, strong family advocate. And she's had the opportunity to sit on the statewide transformation panel with the commissioners and the governor's office and has a strong voice in family members and change and then just providers in general. There's something for everybody. Uh, If people want to register, they can contact the Resource Center here. Go to your uh, website, $99 fee. This is fundamentally for the full day, Thursday, May 12th. And where exactly at Chautauqua will you be? It will be held at Bellinger Hall. Okay, Bellinger Hall near the north end of Chautauqua Institution. Exactly. Okay. Before I open this back up to both you and Michelle, and Steve Watterson does join us in the room, Vicki Bardo is also here for a more general discussion because the picture that you're painting here today is very interesting from the perspective of someone who comes from the outside from time to time to the Resource Center. But I want to hold back on that because there's one other speaker that we haven't mentioned that is going to be very appealing to, I think, a lot of people. So would you please tell us about Kevin Hines? Sure. We're very excited to have Kevin Hines joining us. And not only will he be doing a breakout session on the zero suicide movement, he'll also be our closing address, our closing keynote. He has written a book called Cracked, Not Broken. When he was 19 years old, he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge attempting to commit suicide. He has a long history of mental illness from the very, very early age age and he's one of 34 people ever to survive that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and he's lived to tell his story. It uh, should be very interesting, very dynamic. I just completed his book a few weeks ago. What, 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 well, don't tell us the whole story, no. but your impressions of it, Heather. It, it was one of those stories that you couldn't put down. It, it was uh, it was a very good read. It was you could relate to it in the sense of I've worked in the field for twenty three years now. You could see bits of other people I know that have mental illness in the journey that they've been on. The story from again when he was eighteen months old and has told it to current time. I think he's in his mid thirties now many, many people will be able to relate to his story. And I'm sure in person, it's going to be very motivational, very engaging. And he really pulls together a lot of thoughts and a lot of things that will really make you question, I think, services in the way that they're integrated right now or not integrated. Interesting. And this is uh, Steve Watterson's wording in the news release I'm looking at now. He's developed a 10-step regimen to stay focused on a life path and monitor the signs of falling off the track. 
I certainly could use that. <laughs> yeah, I, I really think, again, from I, I've never heard him speak in person. I've read his book, and I really think that it's going to be very connecting and very engaging no matter where you are in life, whether you are a person that has a mental illness or has just experienced that from a family member or just happened to be in the field or just of general interest, but very motivational. We have a few minutes left on Share the Vision today. We are encapsulating here the upcoming Educational Symposium Thursday, May 12th at Chautauqua Institution for the Resource Center. What I would like to do now is to get all four of you in the room with me up toward the microphone here. So if you want to readjust those for a second, go ahead. Steve and Michelle will be here and uh, also uh, Vicki and Heather. And, Steve, thank you for joining me on the show today. It's always great to have you uh, in the room. I'm sorry I was late. I had a personal matter to take care of at home. And then when I was coming in the building, there was one of our panel presenters was getting into her car. I said, what are you doing right now? She said, going to lunch. I said, you want to come up and be on a radio show about the symposium? And Dennis, she got this deer-in-the-headlights look and said, no. I don't know what's so Uh intimidating about you, but she didn't want to come up and be on the on the radio show. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. He's saving it for next week. I, I think I need to talk to Kevin Hines right away. <laughs> and, and, and Vicki Bardo, welcome to the microphone. Good morning, Dennis. One of the things that has been my experience, being, uh, again, from the outside, looking in over a period of decades here at the Resource Center, is a movement. And, uh, Steve, you'll have to help me with the name of the facility, uh, Long Island or somewhere in downstate New York, that really began many years ago a movement to... Uh, open up the view of how we helped persons with disabilities. There are some people who have become consumers at the Resource Center. Who are Willowbrook? That? Willowbrook, that's it. So uh, that was uh, 1980s at some time? Willowbrook, I think, opened in the late 40s, and really the uh, atrocities, if you want to use that word, uh, the, the very poor way in which individuals with intellectual disabilities were treated and, and warehoused almost in a uh, facilities like Willowbrook and, and other places came to light in the mid to late 60s and then it was in the early 70s that uh, there started to be a concerted effort to close those facilities down and, and have individuals who were living there be able to move back into their home communities and, and live amongst their peers and neighbors just like anyone else should. Thank you for setting that stage and, and helping the date references. So from the 70s to today, this evolution that goes on, and some of it in recent years, seems to have been a rather tense evolution in terms of having to find new pathways for persons with disabilities to live and be successful in the community because of changes in funding or changes in uh, approaches to helping persons with disabilities. But the picture that I see you painting today by talking about the people who are coming to this symposium is one of extraordinary change, further change, greater independence, greater opportunity. It's a different picture than anything I think I've ever seen before. It is. I think we've likened it to the next paradigm shift that's going on in this field. And it was, it, it was you know, that many years ago in the 70s that there was the big paradigm shift from deinstitutionalization to community-based residences and ICFs and the way that we've supported people probably for the last 30 years. In the last few years, we are breaking through that next paradigm shift and culture change where individuals should just be living in the community, supported through normal resources, going to college, having friends and family and the same opportunities, not as specialized and segregated opportunities as living in group homes and going to segregated separate things and we've really embraced that and I think have been on the cutting edge as an organization in doing so. But at the same time there are some persons with intellectual or physical disabilities who certainly need a certain level of support and taking that away from uh, uh, an institution or an ICF, a group home if you will, and providing the same or a similar necessary level of support in a different, more independent environment has got to be a very intricate, carefully done piece of work. It is. It is. And that's where the challenge comes in any of the advocacy and the difficulties that we are having because nobody ultimately disagrees with the end goal of increased independence. I think where we have disagreement with the state and CMS, the federal government, is the manner in which they're moving towards that because it has to take such intricate planning. You can't go from living in a 24-7 supported opportunity to 
here's an apartment and you may get two or three hours a week of support. That has to be a transition. And it's almost as if the funding and the regulations are pushing something faster than the system and the individuals and families are able to prepare for. So we're always in this dichotomy that we don't disagree, that everyone should absolutely meet their fullest level of potential, but in some cases you just can't pull the Band-Aid off. Well, and uh, the degree to which, and we talked about this earlier in the show, that you are relying on technology to help you uh, and perhaps motorized assistance for persons who have uh, challenges in moving I mean, the, t- the technology, the mechanization has to be there and working in order to support these changes. Right, right. And, and people have to have natural supports. They have to have friends, family, neighbors. If you leave your house in the morning and you have a flat tire, uh, you know, you might have a neighbor that could come help you or somebody that could help support that. You're going to call Vicki. She lives uh, next door. Right. She's going to drive you to, to work. <laughs> Individuals that have lived in congregate settings Unfortunately, their primary support is paid professionals, paid staff. They maybe have not always had that opportunity to get to know their family, friends, and neighbors in the same way that you and I have. So this is really about that change that everybody is in equal citizenship and should have that same opportunity for growth. Michelle, Vicki, Steve, any final comments on anything that we have talked about here today? This is Michelle. I just wanted to say we wanted to thank both the DDPC, the Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, and filling the gap for some grant funding that they've given us to be able to provide this um, great opportunity for learning and sharing that's coming up. I just wanted to add that I'm very excited about the panel and the guest speakers. I'm very interested in hearing Kevin's story and also the housing technology ideas. And furthermore, if if there's anyone out there who would like to attend, we certainly have the room. Don't wait too much longer, as this will be airing on Saturday. But uh, get on the website and register. If you have any questions and want to talk to somebody, you can always give me a call at 661-1477. That's Vicki, who's going to take me to work when my tire goes flat, just to make sure you... (laughs) Uh, knew that. Well, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to not only talk about this symposium, but to really encapsulate some of the significant changes that are occurring in the world of uh, the Resource Center today. This has been a wonderful and uh, really very effective broadcast to Michelle Albaugh, Heather Brown, Vicki Bardo, and Steve Watterson. Thank you all for sharing the vision today. Thank you, Dennis.